Hi, this is Professor Cummings, and I wanted to get with you another video on this one. I wanted to continue with the geometric dimension and tolerancing, but I wanted to talk about gauging, dimensioning, and a little bit into errors or different types of errors that you might run into when you're you're doing inspection, which also can affect you know how you're drawing and all these things tie together. Now, if you haven't seen uh, the last video, which was a part one, you know, this will be a part two. If you haven't seen part one, we actually answered the question of why GD and T. Uh, so what we discovered, what we talked about was that GD and T helps you communicate your part intent. It helps you intent, uh, draw the and function through the design, how it's being manufactured, as well as how it's being inspected. We also went through the fact that it's a more precise depiction of part features. So it gives you some ideas to how part features are not only working together, but you know how they relate to each other and they relate more to how they're going to function. And then they showed a feature to feature relationship. So how GTNT gives you a feature to feature relationship, and we use a generic part to kind of talk you through this, and also went over some of the you know how this relates back to the ASME standard. So it's a standard through inspection. And if you haven't seen this video or if you're not up to speed on any of those things I would recommend you go back and look at that video through my playlist you know it's a fairly short video for the considering the subject matter um, and then you know then you can start this video also any other videos that you might see just go ahead and, and subscribe and, and now as I continue this series you'll get more up to date so these that's what we reviewed you know again that GTNT is uh, you know communicates part intent and function which is going to be very important in, in this video <clears throat> so what we're going to be looking at this time is different types of gauges you know the different types of errors that can come with these types of gauges as well as different types of dimensioning style and what I'm going to go over is how these things all tie back to GD and T you know so these you know these things all are part into play with you know how a blueprint is written as well as how inspection is done as well and how you know this can actually help you making a, a more uh, useful more uh, higher quality part all right so first let's start with some definitions or at least this definition okay what is a gauge a gauge you know the technical definition of gauge is an instrument or device for measuring the magnitude amount or contents of something typically with a visual display of, of such information so it's something you measure things with and you get feedback from it and from there you make your decision on whether or not it's a good or a poor quality part as this relates back to gd and t now again as far as inspection center, we have two different types of gauges we have a variable gauge and we have an attribute gauge or also known as a functional gauge so variable gauges they tend to give precise measurements they're flexible they have a lot of different applications. You can actually take a variable gauge and measure several different types of features with it, several different types of components. But they are prone to certain types of errors. And two of those errors are cosine error and zero error, or sine error. You know, it's, you, you see on the left, you've got a pair of uh, some micrometers. And on the, the right, you've got a dial indicator. Both of these are considered variable gauges. You know, you've got a drum that actually gives you your reading you know you tighten down or, or draw down your anvil you measure your part is, is the gap here you know turn down your, your drum actually get your reading here and so it's a variable gauge you could take this gauge and, and measure a variety of different components this is just a dial indicator you know this needle or probe actually travels in and out you know, so if you put your, if you set this at a fixed position, you can move things underneath and see how much they vary. You know, and the the needle will give you some indication as to how much it varies from a, a set zero point. So that's variable gauges. Attribute gauges are, are quite a bit different. They work within a specific tolerance range. They tend to be fairly fast and simple. You know, something that once you know how to set it up once, you can set it up you know, very easily several different times. They don't have a lot of moving parts. Some even, I do say no moving parts in most cases. And they are tailored to a specific application. So you, if you have a, unlike these uh, variable gauges where you can actually measure several different components with the same gauge, 
attribute gauges tend to, because of this specific tolerance range that they work in, this, this narrow range they work in, they tend to be very specific to an application. See some examples of one. Example of this would be a thread gauge. You know, you're only going to measure a certain type of thread that way, and you're only going to know whether it's good or bad. This is a plug gauge within a certain tolerance range, and it's, again, you've got a red, it's bad, green, it's pass. You know, so it's either go or no go, you know, sides gauging. And the same here, these are just uh, bore gauges, you know, the, depending on the diameter, similar like an inverse of the plug gauge. There's a range of diameters, and one actually is passing, one is not. So a very ra narrow range. And these are all tend to be a, a little more expensive, or tend to be more expensive because they are customized to a very narrow range. But they're all fairly quick to use, fairly easy to learn, and they don't have a lot of moving parts, so they don't take a lot of maintenance. So that's a little bit about the two different type of gauges we're going to go on, variable and attribute gauges. Now. Some examples of an attribute gauge. You know, I showed you, you know, the thread gauge and the plug gauge, but they can actually be fairly complicated. It's actually possible to take a component and put it into a an attribute gauge. You know, one of these highly engineered attribute gauges and measure several different features on it at one time. You know, so in this case, you've got some sort of a uh, an aluminum component that's been put into this gauge. You know, these two sets of gauges it would simply get clamped down. It can only fit one way. As you can see, the gauge is designed to only fit one way. Uh, and you can clamp it down into place. And from there, you've got a series of plug gauges to verify whether or not it's actually a good or a bad component. So you would go through a measuring different types of features on here. You know, they're typically very uh, well assigned features so that there is no guessing as to which plug gauge goes to what and you know whether or not it's a good or a bad part. Same goes with this gauge. So you've got this part that actually fits down onto this gauge, gets clamped down into position, and now you've got these different types of gauges that can actually go in and let you know whether or not it passes into the feature that it's supposed to be. So these are attribute gauges. Like I said, they're very, very quick to use. They tend to be very highly customized, and they don't have a whole lot of moving parts. However, they are highly customized gauges. So you could tell just from looking at these gauges that they are very, you know, tend to be fairly expensive. So, you know, this isn't a, a cheap gauge that you're going to get, you know, off the shelf, you know, from your McMaster car. And also going back to GT and T, these gauges actually represent the true geometric counterpart because these features are all based off of datums that are, you know, going to be signed with your, your component. Now, the other gauge is a variable gauge. Now, these gauges are a lot more flexible, have a lot more latitude. So you can see that you, there he gives your dial indicator. He's got a dial indicator in some sort of a fixture. And as he would rotate this component, you would actually see you know, the high points and low points on this cylinder that he's measuring. So he'd rotate the cylinder, you know, around counterclockwise or clockwise after setting his dial indicator to a, a known zero point. So there's no datum that he's dependent on. And as he rotates, he'll see the range uh, highs and lows on this gauge as to how much the gauge, the component varies from that particular datum. Now that can be a very difficult skill to master. I mean, I've known people, you know, work in an industry that, you know, they are very good at this, but the first time anyone uses these gauges, there is a learning curve because setting it up, establishing the zero point, and then reading the gauge as it goes through its rotation can take a little bit of, of discipline. Now, the beauty of this type of gauge, like I said, it's, it's highly flexible. So you can set the same dial indicator up into several different applications. Here you have a, a brake application, you know, setting a, the dial indicator up at one point, establishing a zero point, and now looking at the highs and lows as he rotates the, the brake, the disc brake. Here you have a, a gear housing or a gear, uh, or excuse me, it looks like a transmission uh, a clutch. So you could take this and, and rotate it. We'll just get the dial indicator set up, rotate it around, you know, clockwise and counterclockwise. Looking for the highs and lows as this probe travels in and out. 
and determine you know how flat or how you know even the surface is. You can even set this up in applications like the tool itself, the machine itself. So here's a lathe with a dial indicator established. So again, these are very highly variable gauges, very, very uh, flexible gauges. Uh, it can be uh, sent to a lot of different applications, not very expensive, but in each one of these applications, there is a skill involved in, in doing that setup. Unlike your attribute gauges, which was essentially just a plug and play, you know, set it into its fixture, the true uh, geometric counterpart, clamp it down and proceed to see if the, the part is functional. Now, like I said, one of the downsides of variable gauges is their tendency to have error. So just to get another definition here, what is error? Error is the difference between a measured value of a quantity and its true value. So let's go ahead and put a little emphasis here. The measured value versus a true value. So that is an error. So depending on what the, the part actually is or what we desire it to be versus what we actually measure it at. You know, there are two different types of errors I want to talk about. One is a sign error. You may also hear it called an Abbey error. And the other one is a cosine error. Now, these errors are very, very similar, but there is a small difference, and I want to talk about what that is. Now, in, over on the left, you have a veneer caliper, and on the right, you've just got a ruler. Both of these are variable gauges. You know, variable gauges, you actually, you know, again, because they're calibrated, you know your measurements vary you have a variable gauge now these are exaggerations of the different types of errors you know as you can see you know, you got a ruler that's you know tilted at an angle and the veneer calipers you've got a a very abrupt angle as it's measuring this this round component now both of these errors the sine error and the cosine error by definition they're just magnifications of an angular error over a distance so magnification of an angular error over a, a distance. So this, whatever this angle is, like I said, it's exaggerated. But if you have any kind of a, an ang angular error here, as you put your, your gauge into place, whether you have your ruler that have been a slighter angle, you're going to see a more exaggerated error as you get to the other end. Same here with your veneer calipers. If you actually crank down on it too hard, because of the way this is designed, you can actually end up having some distortion at your point of contact, creating a cosine or excuse me, a sine error over on this particular over where you're actually doing your reading. And your reading is here in this calibrated section of the of the caliper. So you're going to see some sort of an error. Now remember the definition, it's your measured value versus your true value. So you, in this case, you're assuming that you've got a nine well, the error will look like you've got a, a 90 millimeter wide piece when in fact you've got something very different based on you know this you know, the amount of error that you have. So what's the difference between a, a sine error and a cosine error? Well, this goes back to something you learned probably in trigonometry called SOKATOA. So SOKATOA. So for the sine is equal to the opposite over the adjacent, the sine of the angle is equal to the opposite side over the, over the excuse me, the hypotenuse. For cosine error, it's the cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And of course, tangent is the uh, tangent of theta is equal to the opposite over the adjacent. Now, how does this apply back to your gauging? Well, if you look at where your, your measured value is, in both cases, your measured value being here, and in this case here, you know, following the, the black arrow, versus your true values, which would be here and technically here, you know, that's what your error is. So how we'd establish what both of those errors, you could do it with a right triangle. So if you look at this and you see the right triangle that is formed between your true versus your measurement, in this case, your true versus your measurement on both sides, you can see that in order to find the true angle for a cosine error, it is the hypotenuse times the cosine of theta. Now remember how that was established. Let's write this out. Cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent. In this case, the adjacent is this leg here. So the adjacent 
over the hop uh, over the hypotenuse. In this case, that's L. So just to solve for that leg, it's equal to L times the cosine of theta. And that's how you end up with this here. So L times the cosine of theta. And the same here with the sine of theta. It's equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. And in order to get this opposite, just solve. And it's the hypotenuse, or excuse me, in this case it's L times the sine of theta. So again, both of those have a certain type of error that comes with, with a, a, an attribute gauge. So that's one of the downsides of an attribute gauge. They, they're not as expensive typically. They have a lot more flexibility than a functional uh, gauge, but variable gauges uh, tend to also be prone to certain types of errors, you know, a lot of times due to the fact that they have that ability to, to measure, they have the ability, ability to uh, vary. Now, let's also talk about the drawing itself. Now, there's a couple of different types of drawings. One is known as a baseline, and the other known as chain dimensioning. So, uh, baseline dimensioning and chain dimensioning. Now, in baseline dimensioning, your features are dimension from a common origin. Okay, now that sounds uh, familiar. So, you've got datums that help establish your your features and that's how this particular part or how that's one method of dimensioning a component or creating an engineering drawing is through baseline dimensions chain dimensions or chain dimensioning the features each feature is dimension relative to each other and they both come again with their own pros and cons they're good and bad and you know different types of applications and we'll go through both of those so in an example of baseline dimensioning is this. So I'm going to look at the same type of component to describe both of them. So here you see you've got a component, just a rectangular feet, a rectangular uh, component here with three different uh, holes, three holes. The first hole is 10 units from this baseline. Baseline's here, 10 units from this baseline. The second unit's measured from the exact same baseline, and it's 25 units. So let's just go ahead and write that in. So 10 units, 25 units from the same baseline. And then from the same baseline, again, you've got another hole that is measured at 40 units. And again, they're all using a common baseline. So again, this is sort of like when we were talking about the GDNT uh, uh, true geometric counterpart. So they're all using that common datum. Now, chain dimensioning, you've got the same type of component. Only this one is this you know, same three bolt holes or same three holes. This one is measured by using the chain dimensioning method. So you've got this one edge. Don't want to call it a datum quite yet. And this hole that's 10 units from that edge. Then you have the second hole, which is 15 units from the first. And then the third hole, which is 15 units from the second. Now, offhand, it doesn't seem like there's much issue with measuring a part this way. You know, if you, if you look at the component, they all sit in the same spot. You know, they are there, you know, mathematically, you can see that this is still 40 units away from this edge. This is still 25 units from this edge. You know, and these are still, you know, this is still 15 from the second. And over here, this one is still 15. Or this is 15 from the first. And this last this last hole is 15 from the second. So, so right off the bat, you can say, okay, well, what's the difference? You can measure, you can dimension a part either way and you'll be fine, right? Well, no, there's actually some subtleties and there's a reason that you want to use one versus the other. Now, you can think of this baseline. You know, this is, there's a reason that when you measure, say, a person's height, you, you know, you, everybody wants to take their shoes off and they want to stand in the same spot of the floor. It's because it gives you a common datum that you're, you're measuring from. So in this case, you've got three different people standing on the same base surface and they're actually able to see their height 
not so much relative to each other, even though they mathematically can calculate that, but relative to this common floor that they're, they're standing on. So it uses an established datum. However, the rel relative dimensions aren't readily apparent. Now, again, these are very simple examples. It's easy to do the math on these, but on much more complicated parts, those those dimensions may not be might not stick out quite as much. Now, let's look at chain dimensioning. Some of the benefits of that. So you can see this. You know, there's some dominoes showing that there's a relative effect of one for, from the previous to the next part. So there's relative dimensions are significant. So what what you measured in one part is going to uh, impact what's measured on the other part, much like with dominoes. However, there, now here's one of the things that you can see as the issue. There's a potential for stack up errors. And all a stack up error is saying is that if there's an issue with something along the line, so, so let's say part number two, or let's say even number one, whole number one is slightly off. So it's it's at 11 instead of instead of 10. If you're using relative dimensioning, and you're just trying to put this component together, you might not necessarily see why your components aren't fitting, and you may have to go back and do some more measurements because it doesn't always stand out, you know, until you go through each one of those measurements and start figuring out what's wrong with, you know, what. And, and if these stack off, say, that, say this was 24 holes, you'd have to go through that entire chain to see which one of the 24 holes, if maybe multiple of them are off. So again, that's what a stack up error ultimately can do. It can actually cause you to have a chain reaction of several different uh, issues, several different features that could possibly be the culprit if there is some sort of nonconformance. You know, the downside of baseline is that if there is a significant reason why you need relative dimensions from one to the next, it doesn't always come out unless you do math again to go back the other way. So ideally, you'd want to use combined dimensioning. So it's the use of datum and chain dimensions. So here's an example of that. So in this component, you can see, if you look at it carefully, you can see that you do have a baseline or datum dimensioning. Baseline being this edge establishing as a datum and this edge establishing as a datum. And using this as an origin, you can start measuring off of this side to this side. So you've got this dimension and measuring here, and up at the top, which is where it's more apparent, you've got a baseline that measures both the overall length of the part, or overall width of the part, at 4.000, as well as up to the first shoulder at 1.500. So there, there is relative dimension, or excuse me, baseline dimensioning, using these two shoulders as your baseline. Now, there's also chain dimensioning. Chain dimensioning is showing the dimensions between these two holes being at 2.500 apart. So there's a relative importance or importance to the relative dimension of these two components, as well as this little notch here, where you can see the wall, the difference between the wall is supposed to be exactly at 1.000 inches. So those are uh, chain dimensioning. And the reason that, and well, and then you have this feature here, this at 0 .0, 0, uh, 0.500. So these are times when you'd want to use, say, a functional gauge. You could actually get a fixture measured together that has a fixed dimension of 2.500 inches apart and plug these two gauges and actually say, is that relative dimension set? Whereas these sort of dimensions, these chain dimensions, or baseline dimensions, excuse me, would be more appropriate if you had something like a variable gauge, or it could be more easily be done with a variable gauge. And same goes with this notch. With this fixed measurement here, you could actually develop a functional gauge to measure whether or not that notch is in the appropriate amount. So now let's apply this into a more of a GTT example. Now we didn't go through all of GTT in part one, but we did go through datums. So in this one, you can utilize the datums of your features or datums for features. 
Second, it shows the, the relationship between particular features are recognized. So the importance of this spacing is recognized and the importance of the dimensional that notch are recognized. So how does this apply to GT and T? G, D, and T. So we look at this particular drawing. It's got both G, D, and T as well as uh, chain dimensioning and baseline dimensioning. Again, you know, how do we know this is baseline? Because we've got datum C, datum B, which is this shoulder and this shoulder respect, respectively. Ah. This shoulder and this shoulder respect, respectively. So we've got a baseline as well as this feature here, another baseline or datum. And then a datum here. This is datum D. And here we have, oh, that's it, datum, uh, datum D here. So we've got you know, these four datums to call out. So we have something that's being measured from these datums. So, so we've got datum dimensioning, baseline dimensioning there. And then we've got relative dimensioning here, the spacing between the holes as well as the spacing relative to the holes. So we know that these holes are res with respect to each other, so we 91.2 units apart and 40 units above and you know, below. And the center hole is 45.6 from this uh, uh, rightmost upper hole. So we've got baseline as well as chain dimensioning taking place. So we utilize sta established datums for baseline, and we address the fit and function of relative dimensions. And this is how things tie together with G, D, and T. Now, in our upcoming videos, again, if you, uh, if you subscribe or leave some comments, you'll see how all these things tie together and start to get more and more into G, D, and T. We'll start to go more back into this control frame and start to understand more with the tolerance zone and geometric features, as well as how these things turn into the, you know, go back to the datums. Again, this is Professor Cummings. Thanks for watching, and again, subscribe, and you can also find me on Google+, Facebook, and Twitter. Thanks for watching.